But when you step like to the left or the right of the toilet and kind of put your weight down, you can feel the floor like waving because they took out all the support. And I feel bad because someone's going to come in and buy that cash with no inspection. They're going to get in and see that their floor is, there's no support on it. That toilet is literally being held up by subfloor. Mm. It's, it's baffling. Um, so that's a worry of mine. But yeah, all the prices are going up, um, which means they can sell it at a higher price, but they're getting it at a higher price. And they're feeling like they can cut some corners to try and make some ends meet. And a little scary. Yeah, we have also a problem with Canadian government um, putting, like, apparently they're putting very, very uh, bad laws in place for people like us because uh, um, already we're taxed at a very high rate and mm -hmm. Quebec is the worst province to be taxed in. And then now they, they consider that you are making too much profit, which is, you know, what's the definition of too much profit? Basically, they're going to like really restrict you. And even as a landlord also. So they're really, really trying to squeeze, which is really stupid because that's a way of us contributing to the economy. We're like a small entrepreneur, but they're really yeah. trying to squeeze us out of this business. Yeah. Is that as a recent yeah, it's recent. The law hasn't officially passed. They've been like uh, threatening it and nobody knows when it's going to actually happen and what exactly is going to be in it. But they say it's going to be either this year or next year. Gotcha. Is that with the new the new president coming in or is that? Well, we don't have a president. Or prime, have minister, prime minister. Yeah, no, Sorry. it's Trudeau. Yeah, it's Trudeau. Well, he was been uh, reelected. Uh, in the fall so he's got another term I don't know four years or something okay so yeah and uh it's becoming you know it's becoming harder and harder to do work even renovation work here and they're taxing you everywhere and they're asking for all sorts of licenses and it's only in Quebec and it's ridiculous because they're asking like to pay for like a contractor license, which is totally useless and it doesn't mean anything. It's just the government collecting more money. And now we just got an email that starting in April, they're gonna require every, to maintain your license, you're gonna have to follow uh, continuing education courses every mm -hmm. two years, like up to 32 hours. And obviously, you know, you have to pay for those courses, right? Yep. So like we're, you know, we're at an age where we just don't, we're done with this. Like we need yeah. to move on and find other ways of uh, income. That's why I'm looking into Airbnb and some properties like in Italy and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. welcome to continuing education. It's a blast. <laughs> but yours is 36 hours. Ours is only 12. Yeah. So every two years we do 12 hours. Yeah. I was just saying, I didn't think it was that much. No. But I get to do continuing education on the GC route and then continuing education on the agent route too. So I get 24 hours every two mm -hmm. years. I didn't get um, to do continuing education for the GC part. Yep. It's a blast. And at least on the agent side, they've got, and I don't know what it is up in, in Canada, but we actually get like videos and we have an attorney who's working with the state who talks to you. And it's more of like a, not quite a zoom meeting where it's a conversation but at least you get some personality behind it and you get some face to look at yeah. the gc one is a little gray square at the top of your screen that just goes through a bunch of questions about codes and all that it is the most monotonous boring training i've ever had to do at least for the agent side too you can kind of choose which courses you want to take for the continuing education too correct yeah correct yeah, the GC one is here's your information. Yeah, I think they have the same thing uh, for agents here. They have modules, like small modules. I was yeah. even thinking of doing like a course for uh, agents, <clears throat> like basics of home staging, because I don't think they should be home staging, but they think they should be home staging for their clients anyway. So they still do it. But then I know that they can get those little modules which are accredited. And so they get their units, continuing educational units for them. So how am I going to compete with that, you know? Right. So anyway, yeah. I'm all yours. I don't want to, uh, so you have specific questions you want to ask, but what are we talking about? Yeah, we do this. We do it just as we're doing right now. Just a conversation. Um, there's no like impromptu or there's no prompted questions. We started doing that in the beginning and we felt like it wasn't a good flow for the show. 
So um, we'll do a little intro uh, and then basically you'd give your background of what led you to the position you're in. We can talk a little bit about what you're doing and then you can obviously talk about what you've discovered and what you're trying to get to over in uh, Southern Italy and all those kind of things. So you get to run the show. I'll just ask questions and you can answer how you want. If you ever get stuck, we edit the show. So you can take your time to think of your answers and all that stuff. But otherwise, I just like to see where the conversation goes. Okay, yeah, I want to talk about maybe like Natasha mentioned about some trends, market trends, even for people who are, who are selling or also for people who are staying, because there are some interesting things happening this year related to, you know, a change of the lifestyle. That would be awesome. Yeah. That'd be very cool. Uh, and then just so I don't get your name wrong, Sveta? Okay, perfect. All right. And then we're episode eight, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Double check. Perfect. Well, welcome to the end of the week here, MVP Real Estate Podcast. We have Sveta here from Canada. Um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for giving us the time. Thank you for having me on your show again. I'm always happy to uh, talk with you guys and share our experiences. Yeah. Uh, and welcome back. And we're going to talk a little bit. You wanted to get into trends that you're seeing right now. Um, before we get into the trends and what you're seeing, can you give the viewers a little bit of a background about what you do? And I know you're in a little bit of a transition, so we'll get into where you're going in the show. But currently, what are you doing right now, just so they have a background? So my name is Svieta, and I have been a professional um, home stager and decorator in Montreal, Canada since 2006 when at that time pretty much nobody knew what home staging was at least here locally was more known in the western uh, usa particularly around washington and california this is where the trend started but gradually people came to realize that a well presented well showcased well updated house uh, sells much quicker and for a lot more money which of course makes a lot of sense and that's how the profession of home staging has uh, was born so i got into that profession after being in the uh, information technology arena for the first part of my career and then i really wanted to go into something more creative and something that would have direct impact on people and I could make a difference in people's lives even in a small way and so since 2006 I was I was developing my business I had a physical um, business in uh, a local business in Montreal Canada and I did quite well but after I guess 13 years or so I realized that it with the climate that we have and it was just so much work physical work which people don't realize but you have to carry furniture you have to carry a lot of stuff up and down and stairs and I always thought that I would be useful to a lot more people by being online and being able to share my expertise and things that I've learned and kind of um, customized. I've created a particular simple method of how people can update, prepare, and stage their own homes for sale, and I can help them and guide them into the best possible efficient way of doing that so that they can sell their house for top price. And that's what I've been doing. So I basically took my business online um, in the last three years or so. That's awesome. I actually just went through a showing with someone who was unaware that the house was vacant and they got tipped off that it was vacant because they went into closets and they're like, there's no clothes in here, but there's beds and tables and decorations. I was like, oh yeah, this is staged. And they're like, what do you mean it's staged? And I was like, there's companies out there that literally come in, put up decor, put up furniture and then take it out once the house sells. And that like yes. blew their mind. Yes, so it's I'm surprised that there's still people out there who have who don't know what home staging is because yeah. you know like it was normal 15 years ago, but today I rarely meet people who have no idea what it is. But um, yes, there's, so there's two different types of of staging. One is the one that you're referring to, where it's a vacant property and vacant properties 
are not that they, today everything sells, but under normal market circumstances, vacant properties are more difficult to sell. But also people, whoever comes in uh, psychologically, if there is nothing to look at, but, but bare walls and ceiling and floor, obviously they're gonna notice all the flaws so much more. And also they have no, most people have no sense of proportions and they cannot visualize what a room would look like if it oh. had, you know, proper furniture. And that is the reason why the sellers of vacant properties invest, you know, a couple of thousands of dollars usually, or even more to present and showcase a house. So the goal is not to trick someone into thinking that it's actually lived in home. But the reason for doing that is to allow potential buyer to visualize themselves living in that space and seeing how how that space could be utilized at its best potential. And also psychologically, people just get attracted to a room that is nicely decorated and nicely presented instead of just staring into you know, four empty walls. And so that's the reason yeah. behind what we call the vacant staging, which is what you referred to. Now, where I specialize, because I'm online, I, uh, I can advise somebody on what package they should get, like how much furniture, but obviously, you know, if I am in Montreal and my client is in Wisconsin, I cannot physically bring the furniture over and set it up for them. So my specialty now is helping people in lived in homes. So people who actually live in the house or sometimes they're in a transition. So they still live in the house, but maybe they're buying another house and then they're not really sure how they're gonna move and what they should leave behind. But the idea is always the same, is to present the property that you're selling in the most advantageous way. And this is where I help people to do that. Yeah, and I think you framed it correctly. It's not to, it's not to like mislead the buyer who's coming in because I know on my showings, people are always in like the living room. They're like, do you think our couch would fit in here? Do you think our bed would fit in this bedroom? Like, where would it go? So those type of things, just giving them like the path of least resistance where the, the room is kind of formed to set up this way. This exactly. big of a couch can fit here. This size TV can fit up here. That kind of thing. Um, yeah. It exactly. definitely goes that a long is, way. That is the reason. And also, you know, um, when people are buying, let's say if you go into somebody else's home because it's a lived in home, um, you don't want it to be to look at other people's stuff. So mm -hmm. when you go, it, most people are unable to visualize. So if you go into somebody's home, which is very cluttered and the closets are full of stuff and there is, you know, all this food out on the kitchen counters and, you know, sometimes some things floating in the toilet or which I've seen, <laughs> um, you obviously psychologically you are not really attracted to that type of property and you don't necessarily see the potential. Only very few people mm -hmm. see the potential. Most people, over 90% of people, only see what's shown to them. Yeah. So what I teach home sellers is to take a little bit of time and put in a little bit of effort uh, and a little bit of investment to turn their house into this, you know, model home or showcase home as much as possible. And it's an absolutely proven technique that that will help them generate a lot more sales, a lot more quicker, and they will get a lot more money for their house. Yeah. And obviously the, the whole home staging thing does demand its own industry because that's something that it does take time um, it's not the most fun process. Everybody here has moved once. No one said that they had a blast moving. Now do that like every day, moving furniture in and out. So it's a, it's a hard job. What we've started doing on the home flips and the renovations is drawing um, like mock-ups of the room. So we have everything proportional. We'll, we're able to put in furniture, but it's all digital. So they can kind of- Well, there's of something called, them. you're talking about virtual staging, I suppose. <laughs> I do well, that as not, well. Yeah, it's not necessarily their house. We basically build a model, a digital model, and we can put like the sized vanity that would fit there or how big the shower would or what the tile would look like if you put that in. 
is that kind of still in the visual staging world? Uh, well, you can do, there's something called, that's called virtual staging. And uh, it's pretty much the same idea. And I provide that service. I don't think it is the, the ultimate service. It, to me, it's more of a band-aid. But yeah. if there are certain circumstances where people are either unable to afford real staging or for whatever, but basically virtual staging requires taking pictures of empty rooms. Or yeah. sometimes if there is a piece or two of furniture, it can be removed for an extra cost, but you can't take a fully cluttered home and do virtual staging on that. But yeah. if you have a vacant home or semi-vacant home, you can take a photo and then we can add digital furniture and digital accessories to it. And people really like it for appeal. It shows them what a room could look like. But right. to me, it's not a it's not a proper full solution because when right. they go into the house, they still see whatever is actually there. Yeah. And so, we're a little bit a little bit different because we're not this is on the flip side or the renovation side. So if you go into a house you already own and you want to finish your basement and it's all concrete block. Yeah we get to be able to create that digitally and put in a walkthrough of what the basement would look like because you can't throw furniture down and be like, here, this is what it's going to look like. And it also helps them visualize the space and what they can break their basement or addition into space-wise with like partition walls and all that. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is like a, a pre-Band-Aid to it all. I would, yeah okay but yeah. it's for your clients who want to do the flips um no they could be they could be homeowners and they own their house but their basement was never finished because also new for build, renovation purposes yes yeah, so okay. new builds here the trend is like they'll do the basement they'll upcharge you for it but otherwise they basically just go everything first floor up and they leave the basement unfinished yep yeah, so yeah. we can go in and take a floor plan and then build a digital model of what their basement would so it's look like. It's like a designer. It's like an interior designer design plan. Yeah. Yeah. Before you can actually get to putting all the furniture in. Um, yeah. Just give them some spatial recognition on it. It seems to help because people do, they don't go through a lot of renovations. They don't buy a lot of homes. So to give them some sort of a, a visual appeal of what it could look like helps them see it. People yeah. that, that go through it all the time, you can see what's going to happen in the space or where you put this furniture or like the decor going on this wall. You can kind of see that as you go through it more and more, but I've realized it's harder for people that maybe they've only done one basement remodel in their whole life. Mm -hmm. So they're not really as, um, I don't know, prone to seeing, like you were saying, visualizing. Yeah. So it's kind of a tool that helps. I'm still having a hard time figuring out where to put my artwork after we painted our walls. Like, I don't, like, I don't know how you do it every day. <laughs> well, um, I think it's, uh, you know, like I said, most, some people have this uh, innate ability and it's really minority of people. And I never thought I had that ability to be honest until I hit like my forties. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, and I was never really even interested in decorating and uh, remodeling. But then there's a couple of things that happen in my life. One is when I decided to go into home staging and I kind of learned over time. But I also realized that I somehow do have this innate eye where I can look at a space and I kind of see it in my mind's eye what it should it should look like and I can't explain it more than that and then the second thing that happened is when I met my second husband uh he is a contractor and he's been in renovation business for over 20 years so we started doing things together and of course you know from experience obviously we started with one first flip and then every time we do flip a property and we have to do the whole redesign of the space and we do it together and we fight a lot of course <laughs> i usually win but he's he's responsible more for the um, all the technical sides, like you were saying, is you know about making sure that everything is done up to the construction code and that everything is done properly. Whether I am more responsible for the look and the design and ideas, but we discuss everything together. We're actually in the middle of a flip, and this one is an, an interesting little interesting story because 
um, because of the market being so crazy as we were talking about and houses going so fast and literally with like multiple offers, right? In, uh, in within 24 hours, I actually bought a house while my husband was away in Israel. And it was the first time I've ever done that. No inspection, nothing. I just walked into the house with an agent who was not, you know, much help to be honest. And um, I don't know what I was looking at and uh, I bid on it and uh, we won. So that was kind of a worrisome situation, but everything so far, everything is turning like we don't seem to be having any major issues. The house is small, so it's about 850 square foot uh, ranch. You call it ranch, we call it bungalow, the same thing, but yeah. we're doubling up the space because uh, the basement was unfinished. And so we're able to put two more bedrooms, a family room and a laundry bathroom um, into wow. the basement. So that the is house cool. is as, you know, has plus sides. It uh, has a very big yard. So at the beginning, my husband was kind of negative because he's, he felt that the house is small, which it is. Uh, but with the prices that are so crazy and the inventory is being so low, uh, we're we're really hoping that it's going to work out, but it's a full rehab. Like we had to change the total layout of the house. It's a big, big job. Hopefully, yeah. we'll be done by May, and um, then we'll see, right? Yeah. Well, that's exciting. So, is that? I know you were talking a little bit about a transition in career path. Do you expect that being your last flip? Um. I hope not, because to be honest, I really enjoy uh, flipping homes. And I've been thinking about it a lot versus what you do as well, which is buy and hold. And, um, you know, buy and hold is kind of boring to me because it's more of an admin and dealing with tenants and fixing problems where the reason why we love flips, it's because it's creative and it's taking something that's really, really ugly in the beginning and then going through the unexpected, uh, very stressful, right? Most people don't realize how stressful it is. And sometimes it requires a lot more money than you thought. Mm -hmm. But at the end, when you actually see the result, honestly, we're really proud of what we accomplished. And we don't cut corners. We do everything the way we would do it for our own house. So we usually never have problems at the inspection. And it, I'm just... I, I just like seeing the end result because that's my my creation, my art is in mm -hmm. that. But um, so that will depend, you know, on the market. So of course, as you know, right now the market is very difficult. But I do enjoy flips, and I think it's something that is really of value to us, but also value to to other people. But at the same time, in terms of my business. I realized that now I have enough experience. I think we've done about 12 or 13 flips. So at this point, I have enough experience to advise other people for the first time investors, the first time flippers. So my pivoting is a little bit towards uh, being a more of a real estate coach for people. So I can help them from uh, you know the, the decorating perspective or home staging perspective, but also updating their homes if they want to sell and not just fluffing it up and, you know, painting a room and putting a couple of pieces of artwork, but the actual updating on what's important, which will increase the resale value for them to generate them even more money. And if somebody is a first time investor and they're worried about how the process should go, I'm working on that right now is kind of creating taking my personal experience and, and the, the, distilling it, crystallizing it into some kind of a coaching and a, and a training program for first-time investors. That's that would be fun. And I know that's needed because there's a lot of investors out there that, or well, I guess new investors that don't know what they don't know. So exactly. to have a coach there to help them with all the, the things that come up and pop up randomly as you go through construction and then resale. Um, I know that there's people out there that can use that service. So that's, that's awesome that you're transitioning into that. Yeah. Uh, and you were talking a little bit about some trends that you were seeing. Are you seeing that because of this transition? 
the more uh, no, no. Or... I actually researched it for my uh, for my you know my Facebook community. I have a pretty large uh, Facebook community, and um, at the end of each year, I take the time to look at decorating trends for the year to come. And it's a very interesting thing because a everybody says something different most of the time, yeah. uh, but I try to find uh, commonalities. And there, there is very, this particular year in 2022, there is some very interesting commonalities that came out, which make a lot of sense. And it makes a lot of sense because of the lifestyle that people transitioned to in the last two years because of the pandemic and the way everybody feels during that time of people staying at home and kind of cocooning and um, you know not so much travel travel and hopefully it will change uh, very soon so the trends that came out for 2022 is a green color which is very surprising and we haven't seen that in a long time different shades of green but why green because it's peaceful and it's nature related Yep. So that kind of makes sense because people were depressed and kind of staying indoors and not socializing so much. So they're bringing a little bit of nature into the inside. And that continues with decorating trends, for example, that involve a lot of plants and yep. wood, anything that's natural wood, anything that has to do with nature, actually. So what we're seeing in terms of materials also is natural wood, rattan, um, you know, oak, and combination with live plants. Now, you know, there's some crazy plant people, right? Sometimes I come into a house and literally you can't see their windows because they have so many plants. I'm not myself a green thumb, but I am seeing that because it also has therapeutic effect having plants. So in this year, it's a big, big decorating and interior design trend incorporating plants into the look uh, of the house. So th those are like the major things that we're seeing. And, uh, you know, we're seeing less of cold colors like, you know, gray, and we're going more towards warmer shades. And again, everything goes around in circles, right? Any kind of fashion or trends goes around in circles. So, you know, like when beiges were in style, then beiges, where beige went out of style and we went towards gray. So now beige is coming back into style. So we're seeing more of earthy, natural, uh, warmer colors again, all for the same reason to make people feel good in their home. I have a question. I heard that the open floor plan trend was starting to phase out and they're becoming more like individual spaces because everybody has been home so much. Is that, are you seeing that as well? Well, it's, you know, I think it's very, it's very individually, individual taste. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has always been like, I have a friend who does not like open floor plans because she doesn't like the kitchen being open to the rest of the space because she feels that, you know, the smells and everything else. She doesn't like that. But yes, I've seen that as a trend uh, that, and that the main reason is exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be some kind of a combination because I think the most important thing is people are not necessarily looking for formal dining spaces or like right. very closed, you know, cells. What they are looking for, though, is a permanent home office space. Yes. I yeah. actually wrote a big uh, blog post bl recently, an article. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine to see what you see, you know, in the background, right? Yeah. Um, and because I see sometimes people are doing Zoom calls literally from their bed, or you see like a pile of laundry and kids toys and unmade bed behind them and they're trying to look professional. And to me, like it's just distracting and totally unprofessional. So it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. And I, and I have a, an article that I wrote about it and how to make your background look professional in a simple way. Right. But um, people are definitely needing whether it's if they're lucky enough like me where I have a separate room in my house right now which I can dedicate to my office but if people don't have that then they need to somehow limit a certain space somewhere 
to make it into their little private uh, working space. So that in that respect, definitely we're seeing this. Uh, this is becoming of a more more of a permanent feature. Mm -hmm, for sure. I wish we had space in our house. So you were talking about your little house. Mine's even smaller. It's seven hundred and forty square feet. So little bitty. On yeah. one floor. On one floor. You don't have a basement. No basement. And how many people live there? Two, two adults and one child, half, half. And then adults. two massive dogs. And then two Don't forget the dogs. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, for like office space, uh, you can, there's some clever ways of doing it. Like so I've seen people, for example, under the stairs or even in a closet. Like I literally. Have, like, my office is technically in my closet. I was just so tired of being like in the little closet today. But we have, I have like a little curtain in the background and all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yes. sometimes you have to get you, you have to get creative for sure. <laughs> yeah. So I also like Airbnb. I also have some experience with that. And I'm also building uh, more on, on that experience because I think that trend is not going away. Oh, it is. And, uh, and I think it's a it's an interesting way of, uh, you know, bringing some revenue in. So Natasha, when we were talking and she said she has a long term tenant. And yeah. I'm curious, you know, to know your experience, like, what do you think of short-term rentals versus long-term rentals? Oh, it's really funny you asked that. My husband and I, we were just discussing this the other day because we were looking at getting a second property out in Oregon. And we were saying, well, we wanted this property to be closer to the beach. And we're like, well, it, it would be really nice if we could use the property for us too and have it as an Airbnb. And so we're sitting on that discussion for a while. And then I'm a member of a lot of like Airbnb owner groups on Facebook. And some of the stories you hear from them are just so like detrimental. I'm just like, I don't know. I feel really comfortable because our property management company vets everybody who would be a potential renter with us. So that makes me feel really comfortable knowing that they're going to vet these people. They're going to do, you know, buy annual check-ins on them. They're going to really make sure that the property is being taken care of. So that's why we really like the long-term renters as opposed to the short-term renters. It just, for us, it gives us the sense of security. Now, I mean, on the flip side too, we also understand that the Airbnb renters could be a, a much better income producer, but we just feel more comfortable with the long-term renters. Yeah, it's a different, it's definitely a different transition or mindset to look mm -hmm. into because I do think that Airbnb would bring in more income, but again, mm -hmm. there's more turnover, there's more cleaning, there's more communication, yeah. there's just more work to it. It's so you go, with, you go with that income work balance in terms of what you want. Um, and that is one big thing that I'm trying to get over too, because I would love Airbnbs, but your property mm -hmm. manager and you need to talk way more consistently. Your cleaners are out there way more consistently. Yeah. These are high, you know. I've never had property managers. I mean, I had in Dominican Republic, and it was did not. It was not a good experience. I prefer doing Airbnb? it myself. Yeah, no, having property managers. Oh, okay. And paying them a, a a fee for basically not doing much. That's what it turned to. It turned out to be for me. Yeah, so, it's kind of like an insurance policy. Hopefully, you. I mean, whether you have insurance or not, but you pay your insurance. And then when you cannot do it or you need their help, they're there. Uh, and hopefully your tenants aren't damaging your property and hopefully your tenants are paying their dues. Um, yeah, it's kind of the, the beast of investing out of state or out of your area. Yeah, because also Airbnb, there is an additional expense. Obviously, you have to furnish the property. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So you have to at, 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 at the front end, you have to be able to invest maybe five or ten thousand dollars and you have to fully, fully equip it. So mm -hmm. up to the last yeah. towel and last coffee. Day. So so that's the thing. So once you uh, once you do that, though, like in Montreal, we have a problem with Airbnbs because they don't want them anymore. So it's impossible to get licenses. So yeah. the, the only way to get around it is to actually rent for 31 days days up to 11 months because then it falls into this crack in between the rental board and the short-term rentals because anything that's over 31 days is considered to be not short-term rental anymore 
So that's something really? that I'm considering because when we move out of the, you know, where we are in right now, if we move to the to the lake house, then I have to make a decision. Uh, what am I going to do with uh, with my uh, with my unit here? And so I'm still undecided whether I should try to rent it long term because then it's very difficult to you know to kick the tenants out if you need the property back mm -hmm. and they don't know what condition it's going to be in or whether I will try that not the real Airbnb like not two or three days at a time I'm not interested in that but maybe there is an alternative and I actually did it before very successfully before COVID my apartment upstairs I rented it out to people from France because we have a French school from France very close by and it was furnished and literally they came with their suitcases everything was there for them they were supposed to stay three months they stayed two years and wow. then I had a second family from France the same way the same the same thing they came for three months they stayed two years and uh, everybody was uh, very very happy but they my, my apartment was fully it was fully furnished and they pay yeah. more rent I could charge you could charge a lot more when the apartment is furnished premium yep. sure yeah and there there's municipality rules to the Airbnb uh, situation like we we're saying with the short term but as you were alluding to there's always I'll call them loopholes there's always loopholes uh, some municipalities don't do short term like where me and Natasha live they will not accept Airbnbs they don't want them uh, I mean, but there are there are Airbnbs in our area and the few that have them they're doing it for traveling nurses so they'll sign a contract with the agency that, that schedules the nurses and that is scheduled for months at a time. Now, what nurses in there by a need basis, that all flips. So it was kind of a unique, the contract is signed for, let's say four to six months, but you could have 20 different nurses in there at a time at whatever I don't think we have, you know, I don't think we have that concept in Canada of traveling nurses. Oh really? Exists yeah, we've yet. got traveling I've never nurses, heard of this. Traveling PAs. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's for clinics and all that stuff. Maybe I'll look at that or yeah, maybe I'll look at that. <laughs> you too, Natasha. Yeah, you should investigate that. Yeah, because you can charge more and that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I was doing that when I was researching uh buying my first property out of state. And obviously I would only need it for maybe four weekends out of the year. Uh but I went down the route of like, okay, if I buy this, what is the easiest path for Airbnb? Because I'm not interested in fielding a lot of phone calls. I'm not interested in getting a call at 2 a.m. because something breaks out of state. So I would need to get a property manager. But what would be the easiest path in that traveling nurse? I think it came up in another podcast I was listening to. The concept of renting out to the company and then the company would pretty much tell you who's living there. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And if you can get in with bigger, uh, if you buy in a, let's say a city that has a big manufacturing plant, um, you might be able to, if they've got transient workers who go from plant to plant, like that's another avenue to go into, yeah. but that's all infrastructure within your city that you're looking at. So you can get creative with it. You just have to do some digging on it, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. Good ideas. Excellent ideas. It's possible. Um, so what were, you were alluding a little bit before we started recording about some changes to the laws up in Canada that is now kind of restricting house flippers or rehabbers. Yeah, I don't know much about it yet, but I've seen some articles and it's been going around in Facebook groups that I'm in for real estate investment. And uh, Basically, they are talking about the, our federal government in Canada imposing uh, even more restrictions and even more taxes on people who are making their living from a real estate, um, even being a landlord or being a, a you know, resell, resell properties. The idea is that the government somehow is going to judge um, whether you're making too much profit and they, they want to restrict the people's activities um, because in that area, because they feel that it squeezes the maybe, you know, the lower income uh, population 
out of uh, decent living. So they just feel that a lot of people are speculating and making unreasonable profits. So um, it's becoming more and more difficult to operate in that arena for sure. That's a sticky situation. I it hope is. it works out good for you guys up there. I know we're was... buying out of state. That's what we're <laughs> looking at, right? <laughs> That's our next move is to look out of state or out of the country. Yeah, because I was going to say this is this is federal. This isn't um, Providence. No, apparently it's going to affect all of Canada. And I made sure to call him Providence. I made the error of saying president before prime minister of Providence. Um, no. Getting a little better there. Uh, yeah, that's it's sticky when you start talking about income and too much income because that's completely relative. In it's completely of, relative and it's completely anti-capitalist, right? Yeah. The capitalist society runs on entrepreneurs and people doing, and it's not like, you know, people like us, we, we work very hard, as you know, right? It's not free money. Yeah. And as I always explain to people, sometimes, you know, as we were saying, people who flip properties, just the word even flipping, it's a uh, considered to be negative term. And yeah. people somehow look at you and they think that you are doing bad things or that you're not being honest or that you're making too much money. And I've, I've literally heard that comment several times coming from, you know, even friends or acquaintances kind of saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we know you make so much money. But what <laughs> they don't realize is that during that time, first of all, it takes us, first of all, you know, it's not cash, right? It's the money that we're using. And obviously we're paying a lot of interest on it and we're paying a lot of fees that people don't even think about, but they're holding fees yep. and there are all sorts of other fees that taxes and everything that has to be accounted for. And not only that, but during the time that we work on that property, let's say it takes us four months or six months, because usually we do pretty big rehabs when we do that. Um, we have no income. Yep. So we live yep. off our credit line. So whatever profit we make, first of all, it ends up being taxed like it's 40 at 40 percent. And then you have to pay, you know, twenty five or thirty thousand dollars to a real estate agent. And then whatever is left. It's basically the, the money that we didn't make for the last six months that we were working on the property. Yep. So at the end of the day, you know, like you said, the making a profit, what's reasonable, what's unreasonable, people don't realize that in most cases, doing something like that, it's it's a job and it's a hard job yeah. and it's an honest job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that like people get, they always say the same thing about how you make a lot of money and we're probably out on a beach somewhere and we don't work that hard. Like my nights and weekends are pretty booked up. Like yeah. I don't go on vacations. I don't spend frivolously. Pretty much all of my money is going back into it to make that the end game where I can retire eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just gets super. What I wish they would do because we do follow the same guidelines. We get inspected by the same inspectors we pay property taxes. We we follow all the rules that they that they follow. I don't think we can be penalized on the profit. But what I wish they would do, and we were speaking about this before, where flippers get the bad name is where they cut corners, and they don't do it as if that was their own property. Where if I if I walk in and we're doing a rehab right now where we weren't supposed to touch the bathroom, but as we were running into the wall going into the bathroom, we were seeing water damage. Oh, no. So I called the property, the owner of the property. And I was like, Hey, you might have a big problem in your bathroom. I, I really think we should pull this wall apart. And when we pulled the wall apart, we saw the, the roof trusses were rotten through the headers over the windows were coming out basically like ash. And those are big substantial headers. And you could basically grab it and crumble it in your hand with how much water was seeping down. So that wasn't in our scope of work. I fear that there's other contractors would be like, well, that wasn't our bid. We're not going to touch it. But I look at it like if we do this and you put all the money into the rooms around where your area is and then your house falls down, like that's not going to help you either. Right. So mm -hmm. now we're, we're tapping into insurance because this is like a bigger claim of theirs that they're going to have to do. And I can't see that 
just cover it back up and act like we didn't see it. Like that doesn't register in my brain. Uh, so I do wish that they would come down and make flippers a little bit more uh, accountable accountable for what they're doing and the work that they're putting into it. Um, yeah. Taking out supporting structures and well, trying to- Yeah, here we have, you know, whenever somebody buys, they obviously, you know, bring inspector in. But again, as you know, inspector can only see what they can see, right? They don't necessarily exactly. see everything that's inside the walls. So yep, yeah, that's the tough That's part. why, you know, the way we do work, first of all, we're just not as people, we're incapable of cutting corners and doing something bad. And second, we just want to be clean. You know, when we sell something, we want to know ourselves that we've done everything right and that they're not going to come back and sue us in the six months or a year for, for something because we really don't need that stress in our life. We right. want to sleep Got well. Got enough stress. Time. Yeah, we want to sleep well at night and we want to go on vacation and enjoy our time. So when yeah. we do a job, we focus on it and we put our 100% into it. And then when we sell it, honestly, we had one instance where we had to redo the roof and uh, we did it, you know, because it was something we did the roof, but the materials that we used was the first time we used that type of materials, which we'll never use again. And it just after a year or two, it just started coming apart and the, the owners called us and we went back and it cost us like an extra $4,000, but we had to redo the whole roof and we did it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that you're the last one that touched it, it's kind of have to be fixed. So yeah. you bite so, the bullet on it, so but I'm he, sure that they made, what were you going to say? Funny. I got a phone call from the Oconomowoc City Wastewater Department yesterday because apparently some plumber on our street left a tool in the in the in the uh pipes out like in the street so they're trying to figure out whose house? house whose house it was at <laughs> and i was like uh, no plumber really came out here they just scoped my they scoped but they didn't actually do any plumbing so it'll be interesting to find out whose plumber it was yeah. Interesting. And I'm guessing they're going to need that tool. Is it clogging? Is that why they're wondering? Or are they looking for the tool? What was their... No, no I think it's clogging or something. Oh, that's Because they wanted to find out who hired the plumber. Because it's... The tool is still in there, so... Wow. <laughs> that's about that's about plumber. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to touch on what you're getting into uh, you were talking about, uh, well, I would still say international, but you're in Canada anyways, but more international. Where are you headed to next? What's your idea? Well, yeah. So um, as I mentioned before, we had experienced in the last 10 years, we kind of on a spur of a moment, very emotionally uh, bought a pre-construction in Dominican Republic. And then the house was built and we owned it for 10 years and we traveled there quite frequently and there was a lot of positive things about it but there were also some negative things and so after a long after a certain period of time after five six years uh, we kind of decided to to sell it it took us a long time to sell it for all sorts of reasons but now it's finally sold everything is, uh, is finished it's quite an interesting and stressful experience buying a property in a different country and selling a property and my spanish is okay but not like fantastic so that's also adds an extra level of complexity you know plus you don't yep. really know all the processes and how things work now at this point we're taking a little break in terms of kind of giving ourselves you know a chance to settle we want to travel we want to look at other places we are considering florida actually i didn't mention right. that it was on our list of contenders just for uh investment property for um renting it out not necessarily because i want to be in florida we were thinking of maybe the west coast but of course west coast of florida like around tampa and sarasota but of we course just had a property manager on from the tampa area on i'm show. sorry what we just had a property manager who does those type of of uh vacations yeah rental it's the tampa it's the tampa region yeah 
might have to connect you if that's going to be a viable. Yeah, actually, well, we I, I am we are open to looking at a fixer upper in that area. Our budget is quite limited, so that's what's kind of a uh, we're not sure, you know, because uh, for what we can afford, from what I saw on uh, MLS. It was pretty horrible and I really don't know the areas there at all. I don't know the neighborhood. So that's super important to um, eventually, you know, like if we're going to investigate it seriously to find a trustworthy realtor and then maybe fly down there for a few days to actually see it. So that's one of the areas that we were considering. And then um, we accidentally kind of through through a friend um, discovered that there is potential to buy quite cheaply, unexpectedly cheaply, cheaply uh, in some areas in Europe, in Southern Europe, places like Croatia, um, Greece, and south of Italy. And so we started, we're just in the process of kind of generally looking at properties, what's available at what price. We have certain criteria that mm -hmm. uh, my husband really wants to be very close to uh, the sea. So, but honestly, it's very exciting <laughs> because I never thought that those are the possible opportunities. And uh, we see, and because we have the renovation skills, we are not afraid of taking on a property that needs some renovations or cosmetic changes. So that actually is exciting for us. So we're kind of thinking of maybe buying uh, like a small two, two apartment building and uh, fixing it up and maybe staying part of the year in one unit and then Airbnb. Airbnb. That'd be really fun. It That's would be. And, and of course I would advertise it to everybody I know in North America. <laughs> For sure. Heck yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been meaning to get over, especially if you go to Italy. Let me know if you get that spot. I will. I can... for, for now, it's contender number one. So if things go according to like my research and stuff, we're planning a nice trip in the spring anyway. We just want to move forward with our flip. Like, you know, we, we, we need to do some work actually to move the house forward. Yeah. But um, but we we might go for three weeks to Italy and just go explore the areas that we've identified where we can afford to buy a, a house close to the beach, and uh, and look at look at them you know on site to make a final decision. But then again, you know we don't speak any Italian at all. <laughs> my yeah. my Spanish at this point is actually okay. I can get by even with more complicated topics, but. Um, Italian is pretty much at zero at this point. Italian and Spanish are just basically the same language. So yeah, and I speak French, but still, it's still not quite the same. Anyway, I'm I'm not worried. I'm sure we can figure it out. So you've got three languages. Uh, at four. I speak four. Russian. My first language is Russian. Oh. In, I went to school in French. I went to university in English and my Spanish is just from my traveling and being in Dominican Republic, uh, you know, regularly. That's amazing. So now it looks like I'm going to have to learn some Italian. That is impressive. I struggle with English. <laughs> so I did, a, I did a few years of Spanish, but they don't really push a secondary language, at least from when I was going through school in America. They would take Spanish classes. They offered French. They offered uh, Latin, but that's really about it. And it wasn't a main core curriculum. And I'm, I do see the trend of people outside of the US being pushed with language. And I think if you look at Europeans, it's crazy uh, how, especially like Northern Europe, you know, people in, uh, in like Norway, Sweden, their English is perfect. Yeah, and probably all better the than younger, And the younger generations now pretty much in all the countries, if we even see this trend in Dominican Republic, where I would say people under 30 are quite proficient or trying to be proficient and willing, they want to speak English because they, they realize, everybody realizes that the more multilingual you are in the world that we live in today, the more opportunities it gives you for travel, yep. for work, for business, for personal relationships, for whatever, for everything. Yep. yep. I know Spanish is something on my list to get back into. Like I'd love to learn Spanish. The only Italian I know is from my, my Nana who would speak Italian around the house, but she was only, it was broken Italian, yeah. but her parents would only speak Italian, which was 
it just gets diluted over time because there's not a big yeah. importance to keep that culture going. Mm -hmm. But one well, day- We looked at Spain as well, but we haven't really found there what, what appealed to me, at least visually with the places we looked at, looked a little bit too touristy, a little bit too perfect, like complexes. Okay. Like, okay. you know, like res residences with all the same little houses for British tourists or for British expats who want to have some sun. Yeah. I want something a little bit more out of the box and more authentic. Yeah. Well, that's super cool. I'm excited to hear where, where that takes you. So Let's next time again on, in six months and I'll fill you in. Yeah. <laughs> next time on the show, I want to see you with the new background something in either italy or i'm I'm rooting for italy or florida those are my okay. two picks for you okay i'll but let you know we'll see we'll see where it takes you i'll let you know thank you very awesome. much for your time guys really appreciate it. nice talking to you you too you too enjoy bye. your weekend and good you luck too. house hunting thank you bye bye, bye.